Yeah. That's better. Yeah. Question one. Who is Gordon Bruce and what is Nocdoo Distillery? Well, I suppose the, the important bit first, Nocdoo Distillery. Uh, it's been here since 1894. Probably what we call the class is a, a traditional size distillery. Mm -hmm. We'll make 1.8, 1.85 million litres of pure alcohol a year. We run the place 24-7, 48 weeks a year. Wow. Uh, nice wee twist here as we moved on to single man operation in 2006. So we've got one operator on shift at a time. A lot of people have done that these days, but they throw lots of money at technology, scatter systems, computer, computer controls, and nonsense like that. We've deliberately avoided that here. So the whole process is manually controlled. Wow. Right. So it feels like it would, like the whole world's doing it, aren't they? They're trying to bring down the amount of people they're paying but they're putting sensors and pumps and all this jazz in oh, to mean they can bring people down. So how have you tackled that? to Because you're, you're not doing that. I mean, we spoke to, the first time we heard an Octo distillery was the, the lad we spoke to at the Overton Brewery event, which we'll get into in a minute. <laughs> and um, he was just flabbergasted about how it's all done, like almost shunning that technology and just like, no, we're doing it right and we're doing it our way. So how, how did you manage to get down to that one-man operation without taking all that on board? <laughs> We've got the right people on board. Right. Uh, the guys have got a busy, busy shift. They, they'll spend the whole shift on their feet, continually moving. Uh, 21st century, we all wear a, a tracking device of some sort, be it a, a fat bit or yeah, yeah, yeah. phone or whatever. Uh, one of the guys here, our newest guy, started May last year. He was doing 23 to 25,000 steps a shift. Wow. wow. Uh, that's busy. And nice. what length of shift is that? Yeah, that was a 12-hour shift. So we're on eights during the week, 12s at the weekend. So he's doing nearly two and a half times the sort of goal step count yeah. in a 12-hour shift. Yeah. But he's sleeping well at night as oh, well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's a good diet. Uh, if you're sitting in front of a computer screen all day, you go home from work, you're absolutely knackered. And it's, it's not a nice tired. It's a... Aye, that's uh, me. Aye. That's me. That, that's no aye. fun. No, we, so, we're keen on trying to like, get out and get to the gym and do something because you just come back and you feel like you're shutting down. Like you feel like right? you're just, you're, you've no energy to get up and do anything. And you should have because you've sat in front of something and done nothing all day. Yeah. So <laughs> that's not a good diet. No. <clears throat> if you've been on your feet all day and you've, you've, you've done 20,000 steps, you go home from work, you might be a wee bit tired, but Aye. that's a good diet. That's a good diet. Aye. 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 It's different. So what, is, what does a normal shift look like then if it's one man? They're obviously doing everything. Everyone must be equally trained in everything. And That's right. In the old days, you'd have a, a stillman and you'd have a marshman and they would focus on, on one discipline, one side of the process. Right. Nowadays, the guys all look the same status. They're all shift operators. So they look after the process from intake of raw material, malty barley, yeast, to grinding it, mashing it, keeping an eye on fermentations, distillation. Cool product removal. So it's a busy shift. Aye, so everything from the lorries coming in to almost to pour, pour in the dram, they'll, they'll be looking after, yeah. really, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? That's fab. And how, right. how's that affected the workforce? Because like, there, there must be guys that... You hear about it quite a lot, certainly, in factory environments where, like, they're almost becoming robotic. They're just doing that one thing, one thing, and, and folk are just hating it. Mm -hmm. But it must give the guys a real good variety of, of work to do, and they, they, surely they love that. They do. Aye. Without a doubt. Uh, I, I couldn't speak to either of the workforce. They're absolutely brilliant. Aye. But we've got a guy retiring in a couple of weeks' time. Oh dear. We've had oh, three, 350 applicants for the post. Really? Uh, wow. And we're really struggling to find the right one. Oh, so, really? so you're really vetting these guys? Yeah. And what does that perfect applicant look like? Surely it has to be someone that lives and breathes whiskey that's just here to do it. Uh, <clears throat> preferably not. Uh, oh, really? No, our ideal candidate would be somebody with the right aptitude and attitude. Uh, whiskey mating is a skill, we, we can teach that. Right. Uh, but we, we need people to have that, that drive, mm -hmm. the desire to do things and, and, and do things well. And what, where are these applicants coming from? Like all over the world or is it? Yeah, it's pretty, it's global these is days. Is it? Yeah. That's wow. incredible. And they're all yeah. coming to work here and... <laughs> Well, sadly, they're not, screen, because I only want one. Aye, well, that's it. Aye. <laughs> that's amazing, aye. though. Three, 300 odd applicants to, from all over the world to come and work work here. Yep. That's brilliant, eh? Uh -huh. Imagine building a company that's as renowned to do it. Like, I, 
I, I don't know what corporate positions, what sort of applicants they get, but I can't imagine it's that. I can't mm. even, especially not for a, a passion-led job. Because like, it's not a... I can't imagine it's a job you do just as a, as a stepping stone in a career. This is, you must be looking for someone that's going to be here forever. Yeah. I'd hope so. Aye. Uh, and the guy that retires, he's, he's been virtually part-time. He's only been here for 20 years. Only, only 20 20. years. I bet you'll be sad to leave, uh, to lose him. Aye. He's giving me a big mess. Yeah. Uh, uh, two, two of the team, they celebrate their 31st anniversary this month. Oh, my assistant manager does all the work, keeps the place going. He's 34 years next month. Wow. So. You didn't hear of people being in jobs that long now, eh? Not these days, anyway. No. no. That's brilliant. So, the sort of, um, what's the word for it? The, the sort of community of working here must be really strong as well. You know, is that something that you really put time into and concentrate on? It's is a, that is a real family feel about the place. Right. And small team like everybody's got to help it. Everybody out. The, the thing just wouldn't work if if you had one that was wasn't going to buy into that Aye. and enjoy him like this. Aye, it's quite. I um, you, you hope that more places are like that, but I've got a funny feeling they're not. Oh, I'm sure they are. Uh, well, I hope well, so. I hope yeah. so. Um, but certainly. You know, that number of applicants and people 34 years and stuff. That that must be something you're quite proud of, to have people that want to work here oh, aye, that long. Aye. Aye. Yeah. So, so we talked loads about, <laughs> we've talked about Noctudo, but who's Gordon Bruce? Like, who, who, what brought you to here? How, how did you get into it? What, why is this your thing? This is my baby. Uh, <laughs> we've kind of lived and breathed here. Oh, I'm, well, I'm talking about... Several 20 years, only been part time. I'm, I'm less than that. I've only been here 16 years. I've um, made whiskey for the guts of 35 years now. And um, oh, 2006, we had a, we've got five distilleries in the group. They pulled me, Paul Blair, Spaber, and Paul here. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a, a wee bit of a management team reshuffle in 2006. So, I didn't ask. I got told I was coming down here, <laughs> uh, and it's, it's been great. I've absolutely loved it. Aye, and how has it been working in different? So, you're, were you a distillery manager at other places before? Uh, assistant, my uh, assistant right. manager in Pulteney Distillery, which right. home down in Wick. And how did those places compare to to Knock do? A distillery is more than the sum of the equipment and the buildings. But a distillery's got a unique feel. It's almost like a soul. Uh, and I, I put that down to the people that work right. there. Mm. Uh, the sense of ownership that the guys have for the site here. You ask anyone, it, 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 it's our distillery. It's, right. it's not Inverhouse's distillery, it's not That's International nice. Beverages distillery, it's, it's our distillery. Nice. Uh, Bolton and Ball Blair, crack and we distillers as well, but they, they, they just don't have that same level of ownership, that, that feel-good vibe about them. Right. That must be quite nice when it comes to like looking after equipment and taking care of stuff. You know, if the boys think it's theirs, mm. I say the boys, the boys and girls. I don't know what the workforce comprises of, but when the when the people take ownership of that, you know, that must that must say a lot. Not only in the the maintenance and how things are done, but also for the end product. I like to think that Aye. that feel good vibe I talked about. <clears throat> it does work its way through into right through to the end bottle. Yep. That's good. That's what makes it's good a, whiskey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, so in your 16 years, you say, that's been oh. here? And how's things changed over those 16 years since you got here? Is it, I mean, it, the date on the door, 1894? 1894, yeah. 1894. Started, started making whiskey. Uh, 1890, well, this is the first distillery that SMD, the Scottish Malt Distillers, built for themselves. Up okay. In, uh, up until that point, they were brokers, the wheeled and dealed. I think they had like grain distilleries in the lowland, but first malt distill that's still in the belt the belt. Um changed hands a couple of times. Mothballed in nineteen eighty three there was a, a lock of whiskey. And these smaller, less efficient places, they were expensive to run. Mm -hmm. They weren't particularly profitable, so they were mothballed or closed. Mm. Right, okay. So as a group this is the first distillery we bought in nineteen eighty eight. Fired it up again in 1989, and it's been going great guns ever since. 
So you say it fired it up again, did this have a bit of time where it, where it wasn't producing? Then? Well, it's five years it was mothballed for. Right. N and nearly six years, in fact, from 83 to 83. Where it was just sat still, stagnant, not doing anything? Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, but the place was looked after. Uh, we got wooden washbacks, fermentation vessels. Important thing with wooden washbacks, never let them dry out or they leak. The wood ah, shrinks okay. and they leak. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had a SMD, the Agile, they had a, a, a team of guys that were around and keeping an eye on these mothballed sites just to make sure they were kept in good shape and the, and the hope they were going to reopen someday. Oh, that was good. <laughs> so you see SMD. SMD is, is Diageo, is that right? That's what it's, it's morphed into. It's morphed yeah. into Diageo. So Di is Diageo still a co-ownership no. of this one? No, this is because this is now owned by... Inverhouse. The Inverhouse, aye. We were reading that on the way up. And that seems to be a much smaller firm, more more akin to the sort of family feel that you would see here than the, the massive conglomerate of like the likes of Diageo and stuff. Yeah, so <clears throat> production-wise in Scotland, we've got the five distilleries, we've got the... Warehousing, vying, maturation, bottling, bottling, sales, marketing, all the online stuff's based in Airdrie, mm -hmm. just as like Glasgow. Uh, capacity for probably 700,000 casks, mature than whiskey down there. It's a big site. Yeah. Uh, is that what that site is as you come in here? The It's like there's like a railroad running between it and there's... Oh yeah, just to say Keith. Aye. Aye. Is, is, that, is that first door in, is That's it? That's a Chivas site. And what's a Chivas site? The Chivas, the Pernod Ricard. Right, okay. Okay, I did wonder that, because that, that looks like a big site. Eh? <laughs> uh, that's just a toy compared to the place. Is it? 15 minutes up the road of Mulgamsburn. They've got a massive maturation complex. It's a big, big site. Wow. Right. So, that's... what does the process look like then when it comes to the, the maturing of it? Is it your, you cask it all here, you put it all in this cask here, and then does it just go up there to sit? Uh, we don't have any maturing at the Chivas sides. Uh, right. That's that's for their own production. Most of what we produce here, we'll, we'll put into bulk tankers. That's thirty thousand liters at a time. It'll taken down the road, filled into wood, matured down in the air be used for blended whiskies. Right. Anything we plan to use for single malts in years to come, we'll try to fill, and mature on site. Mm -hmm. So, so you store on site as well. We've got a couple of warehouses on site. Oh wow! Yeah. Brilliant. So it's all happening here? Apart from bottling. Apart yeah. from the actual yeah. bottling, yeah. Aye, I can imagine that's a bit of a... A bit of a, a big process in itself. Yeah. Aye, aye, exactly. I mean, you see these videos of bottling plants and it's just bottle after bottle after bottle going through. Is that the sort of plant that you guys use as well? Or is it's that... a smaller scale. Uh, we, we bottle our own malts in-house, uh, but the big volume stuff, it'll, it'll still go to third-party contractors. Uh, the big volume, I mean, blended whiskies. Yeah, okay, okay. But the, the sort of flagship product as it were would be the smaller scale stuff that you guys are doing yeah that's yeah. right right so talk us through sort of from the point the the malt and everything arrives here what what does that whole process look like for distilling whiskey okay you, you do realize it gets dark before a clock <laughs> <laughs> let's do the abridged version <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll, we, we don't malt our own barley anymore, so we'll, we'll pay somebody else to do that bit for right. us. It's, it's a specialist industry. Very few people make their own malt on site. Mm -hmm. So we'll speak to different maltsters. Well, I'm doing that just now. And we'll agree a specification of what we want from their malt for the following year. Uh, so there's three, four different maltsters we buy from. It, it, it's really interesting if you put the word maltster into Google, you'll get 15 million results from molesters. <laughs> because a, a molester and a maltster are essentially the same thing. <laughs> very little different. Uh, so once we've agreed the spec, we'll, we'll buy the malt from these guys. So malt's delivered here. We'll grind it. We've got a, a fairly modern bit of equipment. that was built in 1964, so it's virtually brand new. <laughs> the, the malt mill. So that's the first part of the process. Our mashing system here is very, very basic mushrooms, but it's high tech, it's a stainless steel bucket, so ideally we want a fairly coarse grind. So we'll, we'll pass the ground malt, the grist, through a, a series of sieves. Oops. Body coming by. Mm -hmm. 24 hours a day you run, yeah. so yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So grist composition here, we're, we're, I want 30% husk, 60% grits and 10% flour. Um, and that, that varies from side to side, but it's really, really important to get that bit right. The mashing bits where we mix the, the dry grist with hot water. So we'll do in three separate stages here. Uh, 
looking for 63 and a half, 64 degrees centigrade for the first water, which is warm enough to July, nice starch, but cool enough not to denature the enzymes, which are still active in the malty barley. We can dissolve most of the, the goodness, the sugars in the ground malt using that fairly cool first water. It's drained off through the false bottom of the mash tun. It's like it known as worts, lovely sweet sugary liquid. Run the worts through a, a cooler, take the temperature down before it goes through to a wash back fermentation vessel. So take the worts down to 18, 18 and a half degrees centigrade. Uh, once the first water is drained, we'll put the second water on, a bit, bit warmer, 80, 82 degrees, and I'll push out more stubborn sugars or starches. So that liquid's drained off, cooled down, it'll join the first water in the same wash bag. So we'll collect 20, 22,500 litres of worts from each oh. mash, add uh, 75, 80 litres of cream yeast. And that stage of the process is very similar to making beer. Right. Modern malts, modern yeasts, uh, we can run them a wee bit warmer now, we can run them with slightly more sugar in it in the solution. So we're probably looking at an alcoholic strength, 9.3, possibly 9.5% alcohol, once the stuff's been fully fermented in 65 hours. So 9.5% is a good, decent strength beer, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's the and first... That, that's just in that 65 hours between it arriving and to that point? 65 hours fermenting. Uh, right. It's a funny fermentation process here. We, we, we stuck an extra couple of fermenters in in 2013. So they're, they're almost secondary fermentation vessels, which is, is quite unique to not do as well. Uh, but if I get a chance to have a, a wee wander about, you, you'll see them. Oh, that'd be smashing. Uh, uh, <coughs> I always think it's, it's such a shame when people think whiskey, they, they, te they tend to focus pretty much on the distillation side, these lovely, big, beautiful copper pots. Mm -hmm. It still is basically just like an extraction process. Okay, we, we, we do have some chemical conversions taking place there and, and separating water and alcohol, but it, it is basically just it's an extraction process. Yeah, yeah that uh, seems like that's very much the poster child of making whiskey. Definitely. You know, these beautiful big copper pots. But like everything you're describing already in the first, you know, sixty-five hours is stuff that I've never heard about and never, I don't know anything about. You know. Well, I, I wish we would look a wee bit more at that because that's where obviously all the alcohols produced during the mashing fermentation stage, right, and that's okay. where most of the smells and flavours in Scotch whisky are produced as well. Ah, okay. Uh, Interesting. So is that the smells you, you know, the beautiful smells as you walk for the car around here? Is that the smells that you're smelling? Oh, yeah, you get a kind of combination of smells. I, I, when I came down just before you guys arrived today, it was got a, a real grainy marsh smell which yeah. is beautiful it just hangs about, the, uh, <laughs> it hangs about in the air in a nice still yeah, day yeah. like this that's ace yeah. so we got to we got to that point your 65 hours of fermentation what's next well, double distillation so we got right. the uh, scotch whiskey is always distilled two or, or three times mm -hmm. uh, here we've got perfectly balanced distillation so the wash still First distillation, spur it still, second distillation. So we'll take exactly half of a wash box, 11,500 litres, 9.3% alcohol. We'll use the heat energy, we'll, we'll, we'll reclaim the heat energy from the, the liquid waste, or liquid co product that's in the still from the previous distillation. Mm -hmm. So it saves a lot of money and energy bills that we can, yeah, yeah, yeah. if we can reclaim, swap that heat over. I, and we're just relying on different boiling points of water and alcohol just to, to separate the two compounds. So mm -hmm. half a wash bag into the wash still, uh, get the boil, the lighter alcohol vaporises before the heavier water, so the vapour's pushed up into the head of the still. Outside the condensing system, the vapour's turned back into liquid, which runs back inside in the spirit safe, the still house. Everything in the first distillation is called low wines. It's a mucky, filthy, impure alcohol, probably about 26, 27 percent alcohol by volume, but we're about, we've put 11 and a half thousand liters at 9.3 percent, and from that we'll collect 5,000 liters at 27 percent alcohol. So it's just a concentration process. Ah, oh, right, okay. So it's really easy, cheap to put water into things, but it's difficult and bloody expensive to, to the get water back out of things. Aye. Yeah. So is that the reason for these stills being that sort of? Um, wizard's hat kind of tipping over, is that just because of the way that you want it all to evaporate out and then I'm taking it that's pouring back out as it collects? Yeah, the size and shape of the still and, and how you drive the still, how you push the still is really, really, really important to the, the flavour and the characteristics, characteristics even that oh, you okay. want in your new make spirit. 
Um, so still if you has, change that shape, it would change the characteristics of the whiskey. Yep. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. okay. Talk to us a bit more about that's really interesting then. So, <laughs> uh, if you've been in a still house, it's, it's a really, really warm environment. Mm -hmm. um, summertime here, we've got air temperatures north of 40, 45 wow. degrees. It's, wow. it's, it's cozy. <laughs> so, when people come in and say, well, why don't you insulate these things? You know, wrap the stills up in insulation. Yeah. But if we did that, we would lose any reflux capacity. That, that still has. So although the copper surface is warm, any alcohol vapour that comes into contact with the copper inside the still, it, it, it will condense. And it's, a, it's, it's called reflux. So vapour recondense, liquid runs back down into the pot. And it's a really, really good way of keeping heavier, maybe some compounds you don't want in you mix, but it keeps them in the waste stream, keeps them in the pot. Rather than distilling through and ending up in your bottle of whiskey. So when you say the heavier weight, is that because they physically cannot make it up and round that sort of gooseneck? That you t I don't know what your ones look like, but I, I tend to see the ones with the sort of gooseneck at the top and then back down. Yeah, well, we call them swan necks. Swan necks, yeah. yeah. right. Uh, and stills. Uh, who's got the tallest stills? Just now? probably like Glenn Morangy, I think. Uh, the, the heads and. The head and the stills get a, a bit big, or the height of the head of the stills get a big impact on the, the quality, the weight, the, potentially the meatiness of the new mix for it as well. Right. These heavier compounds, they, they just, they will not travel that far up. Ah, so they physically cannot get that yep. high up, hence you get less of the, the sort of dirty, heavier, yep. heavier compounds you're talking about there. So actually, in theory, quite simple. But I'm sure... Oh, like, distillation is dead. Someone, you can do it at home. You say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I think making whiskey at home in this country is a wee bit like breaking the speed limit. It's, it's not a crime unless you get caught. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so you... And then this, the two-step distillery, you said... What was it you said? The yours is the two-step... We've got the wash still and the spirit still. So right. wash still, first distillation. So that's a... Refinement uh, that would that would define. So that's probably the best way to put it. The uh, wash still will define, and the the spirit still will, will refine. So we've right. got low wines. The first and second parts, the second distillation. First part's called four shots. And there's lots and lots of alcohol there, but just not the congener taste smell profile that we want in new make spirit. So when the spirit still first starts to run in. We'll throttle the steam right back. We'll take away 80% of the heating surface that still. So you want to run spirit slowly, coolly and cleanly. That's why it's always easier to make whiskey at this time of year when we've got snow on the ground and, and frost. Ah, okay. Fantastic time of year to run the still. Right. right. So when the still first comes in, throttle the steam right back and the still man will keep an eye on the temperature and the strength and more important, the clarity of the spirit. It's got to be absolutely crystal clear. So we're probably looking at 20, maybe 25 minutes in four shots. When it's happy, we'll just manually swing the spout from the four shots bowl into the, the, the new make spirit bowl. So it takes place inside the spirit safe. Uh, spirit's bowl's connected to spirit receiver. When we go on spirit here, we're looking at 75, 76% alcohol by volume, oh. which is fairly potent. And you, you can always set your watch by it. Uh, three and a half hours, Three hours, 40 minutes, the strength of the distillate running in the, in the site, in, into the spirit safe will have dropped down to 62% alcohol. So when we get to 62%, swing the spout back into the bowl we're on the four shots into, jack the steam and the still up high, drive off any alcohol that's left in the pot. So the first and third parts of the second distillation, they'll be mixed with everything from the first distillation, and that will give us the feedstock, the liquid we need for the next charge in the spirit still. Right, okay. Oh. So there's quite a lot that's going on there, yeah. like with regards to it moving through that production line of of bits and bobs. You know, you'd, it seems to be. And what sort of literage are you getting at that point? You know, you talked about twenty two thousand liters reducing to five thousand liters, yeah. but what's that reduction time on time on time? Each run of the spirit still will charge oh, somewhere about fourteen thousand liters of the wines and faints. So the charge for that still. 14,000 litres at 27% alcohol by volume. From that, we'll collect somewhere about 3,000 litres of new make spirit at 60 and a half, 69% alcohol. And what do we have? 
probably just shy of 5,000 bulk litres of four shots and fence. Everything else is, no, we, we don't call it waste anymore, it's a liquid co-product. Mm. Right, OK. Yeah. <laughs> And then bringing it back down to that sort of drinkable 40, 42s that your your product is at, is that just a case of, is it a, is it a watering down process? What's yeah, well, 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 I look in the warehouse as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the the casts that we use, they're, they're all oak. Uh, most of the casts are ex-American oak. Uh, God bless America, the most wasteful race of people on the planet. <laughs> uh, they're only allowed to use bourbon casks once to mature bourbon. And then have to use new casks, oh, which is wow. absolutely right. fantastic for us. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So is that like a like a champagne ruling? Like champagne district, champagne only comes from that district. Bourbon only gets used in a bourbon cask once. Is that like like sort of heritage ruling as it were? Well? Yeah. <clears throat> the, I think it came about the unions got a, a big big grip on employers in the states mm. so we kind of create all these wonderful jobs making new containers be it a coke bottle a beer can or a whiskey cask and you're just we'll take them thank you very much well we'll pay, we'll, we'll pay dearly for them yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely uh, i can't imagine they're cheap things to get over here no. either they're the weighty things yeah supply and demand as well um, the, the whole industry is really busy just now so the demand for quality empty wood is is right up there yeah. So demand's there and the price goes up. Like everything, isn't it? And what sort of literage is it that's going into these casks? Uh, ex bourbon cask were probably 195, maybe 200 bulb litres. And that's going in at this 60? We'll, we'll fill it at 60 and a half, 69% alcohol by volume. The first thing you, you notice when you go into a warehouse <coughs> is the smell of alcohol. It's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> um, we're, we expect to lose 2% or up to 2% of the previous year's contents purely through evaporation. Oh. So that's, ah, okay. And that's, that's a very, very necessary loss. It's part of the ripening process. Right. Uh, so every minute, hour, day, month that they're sat in those casts, they're actually coming down. That's right, yeah. Right. So we'll lose both volume and strength in, in, in the UK. Slightly different in the States, so different humidity levels over there. Bourbon producers, they'll probably fill their casks about 60% alcohol by volume. And water evaporates more readily in low humidity. Mm -hmm. So the volume will go down quite a bit in the cask, but the strength of the alcohol will increase. Mm -hmm. Ah, OK. And the exact opposite happens over here with us. So actually, in all of this, although we're talking about the... You know the big stills and all the processes to get it. It sounds like Mother Nature very much is one of the, the key drivers to what what you oh, do. Yeah, yeah, Aye. yeah. And that seems that that'll be across. So is that why different different areas are very very distinct? Different. Well, I don't know loads about whiskey. I know a lot about about whiskey. I really you like enjoy some whiskey. I really enjoy whiskey. <laughs> funnily enough, um, but you know every area has got very distinct whiskeys. Do you know, is that, is, that, is that to do with the sort of the lay of the land and where they are? and Yeah. Uh, could you be a bit, bit, bit more specific there? Are we, are we looking at Isla whiskies and Speyside whiskies? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, top level it is the sort of Speyside versus an, an Isla or even, you know, where you are in the, the lay of the land and the, like you said, the humidity versus, you know, how cold it is in the area, you know, further north. Further south, you are. You're going to get. It sounds like you're going to get very, very different whiskies purely just by where your facility is. Uh, or is that one? Is it one. not that different? Uh, is it I not different mean, enough? Probably not. To be honest, uh, geography is really, really important. Uh, we we make a peated whiskey here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, most of our production is is plain on peated malt throughout the year, but for five six weeks a year, <coughs> we'll run the distillery in heavily peated malt. And the peat that we use is sourced in Aberdeenshire, and mm -hmm. it's got a really low level of the, you know, that medicinal iodine TCP compound you get if if you're drinking a West Coast or an mm -hmm. Isla whiskey. Yeah, yeah. The, that comes about from a, a compound called Cresol. Uh, Isla peat's got a really, really high level of that compound. The peat that we use, Aberdeenshire peat's got a very, very low level. Okay. So right. we are looking for more of a, a, a bonfire, barbecue, a burnt wood yeah. smoke in our liquid. That sort of smoky whiskey that people talk about, is that where you're coming from? Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. And that's because it doesn't have this this compound in it. It's got cresol, but it's, it's a very, very low right. level in comparison to West Coast Dyla peats. So when you say you're adding the peats into it, is that like a stage that's happening or is that just because of where the, the malts are coming from? Like where, where is that sort of peatiness coming from? When the, the green malt, uh, once during the malting process, when the green malt goes to the kiln to, to dry, or uh, at really, really high moisture levels, you're probably north of 40% moisture in green malt in, in the germinating barley, or germinated barley. Right, okay. Now when the green malt's got that really high moisture content, it's got the ability to suck in smoke and for, for smoke to adhere to the, the husk, the outer shell as well. Right. As the moisture content gradually decreases in the kiln during the drying curing process, the, the ability to retain and capture smoke also decreases. So they want to get as much peat smoke into the process as soon as they can, as early as they can at the kilning stage. Right. So when you're buying and you're specifically buying in stuff that's... That is, that is a process, you say you're still buying in your malts, aren't you? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're buying in ones that have been smoked. Is it, so the kiln's actually fired with the peat? Yep, that's right. Right, yeah. right, okay. So it's the malt that's bringing in that flavour from the peat. It's yep. not, right, right, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. You can you can have a, a really, really peaty water source, and in, if you're using plain, unpeated malt, you're going to produce a plain, unpeated whiskey. Makes it, it does make sense, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And then... So eight weeks, eight weeks a year. Did you say you done that? Yeah, uh, probably barely eight weeks. Six, to, six to eight weeks, six to, six to seven weeks. Depends how the, the, the place is going. Why so short? Is it just because that's the only, that's the demand you've got for it? Yeah, we started making peated whiskey here two, 17, 18 years ago. Oh. Uh, up until that point, if if our company needed peated whiskies for their blends, they had to buy from a third party. The, the size, the layout of the site here makes not do an ideal location for doing experimental batches or, or, or small runs of things. Right. So the, the intention was never to release a single malt or a peed version of the single malt whiskey. But there's so much interest in peat whiskies these days. Mm. And it's a big, big demand the world over for peated whiskies. We'd be absolutely insane not to do that. Yeah, yeah. Would. <laughs> yeah that, that makes total sense. So... You talked about the size of it there then. What What is it that makes Noctu's size so perfect for doing those small runs? Is it just the ability to just run it through the, the processes? It's a really good site. Uh, oh, what do we got? First part of the process, we've got six malt storage bins. So we've got three bins that we've dedicated for peated malt. Three bins we'll use for plain on peated malt. We'll get malt delivered here, loads 28 and a half, maybe 29 tons at a time. Um, you know, some sites, you, you may only have two absolutely mega malt bins that you'll put four or five loads into at a time. Right. So stock control uh, is really, it's quite simple here because you put one load of malt into one bin. You'll empty that, you'll grind it, you know exactly the moment. Then you've recorded exactly what, what came out uh, and you can... You can segregate things the whole, the whole way through the process. Um, it, it's, it's, it's just a good site for doing that kind of Aye. thing. That's just just the, uh, the layout and the yeah. machinery and what, what's all there. And so going back to the sort of the, the one man and no sensors and, you know, going back to one man shift, having the sort of hands-on element of it, how did how do you think that improves that end product? Is that just like that's your vision? That's just what you wanted to do? Is it is it something that's quite important to you to just be like the guys need to know what they're doing? Yeah, it's more of a craft. Aye, basket. that's that's kind of what Aye. I'm getting at. It's more of a craft thing than a we just because I'm I'm sure if you went down all that road of all these sensors, and I'm sure you could push the the liters at the end of the year up and and possibly make more, but would it be the same thing? You know, mm, I don't know. 21st century is grossly overrated. It really, really? Is. That, as indeed were large parts of the 20th century. Um, but I also need to point out, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Luddite, I'm not anti-technology. Yeah. If, if, <laughs> if we can use technology to improve things and make things better, that, that's great, use it. But my biggest concern is, as more and more distilleries become run by SCADA systems and com computer programs, as people, we're going to forget how to do things. So yeah. true. 
And, and once you lose those skills, it's, it's damn difficult to get them back again. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's I, I've harped on about this for for weeks since that the BAE contract to people because the I don't know if you've you heard the BAE have just been contracted for four or five frigates to build for Australia and they're doing it in Glasgow, mm -hmm. um, but they're having to build a whole new naval college to the cost of like ten million to retrain people mm -hmm. because there's a generation gap of guys that used to work on the shipyards yeah. that are now not fit and healthy to teach. And it's only one generation gap. And now they've got none of the skills. You know, it's, it's mad. I rest my case. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. it. That's exactly yeah. it. So it sounds like somewhere, like, and I think a lot of people will, will really want to hear that. Cause, and, I mean, I know the um, guy I work for in special effects, Dave, he's, he's very keen on that. You know, He doesn't want everything outsourced because he wants people to still be able to make stuff in our workshop and still be able to do all that. I think, yeah, that hands-on thing. And I think that, I think that's really important. Do you guys make an active, an active, um, what's the word? Do you actively try and push that? Do you know, in your marketing and stuff that this is handmade, this is a craft whiskey. And how do you guys, if you do, push that? Or do you think it's just something that's known? I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I... We've got this, uh, we, we talked about it earlier, this wee podcast thing that I got yeah, talked yeah. into doing. I, was, I must have been really, really pissed when I agreed to do that. <laughs> because it's so at my comfort zone, and it's not real. Uh, but the, I think part of the backing behind that is, is, is trying to look at craft. Uh, yeah. The craft means so many, like, it can mean so many different things to, to different mm -hmm. people. Um, I, th I think we, we could probably present a, a reasonably strong argument for saying that yeah, yeah. a knock do a knock is a, is a craft, it's a yeah. man-made product, it's not made by machines and computer systems. Yeah. So I, I, th I think the marketing team are quite keen to let, let the world know about that one as well. Yeah, well, I that, certainly think that Overton mm. Brewery thing we were at, yeah. it was probably the thing that that made us go, you know, other than the fact that it was tasting whiskey and strong beers <laughs> next to each other, you know, it, it wasn't a hard decision, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> But knowing that it was, you know, it was all about the craft and the, the PR guys that done it there were fantastic. It was a really good night. We met some great people. Yeah. And th there was a lot of concentration on, you know, the way we, the way that you guys do things here. and the way good that and pleased to hear. It was, it was really, really good. Yeah. How, is that the first time you've done a collaboration like that? Oh, James. <laughs> Yeah, I think I was actually supposed to go to that one, but <laughs> I'm pushing 60 now, I'm just a grumpy old man. <laughs> <laughs> so it's I, one of the brand ambassadors taking on that side of things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was a first. There's another one lined up for sometime next month, I think, in yeah. somewhere south of the border, so I'm definitely not going to that one. No. <laughs> yeah. so, so it's something you, you, that you guys are looking to do more of in the future as well? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, thought, I thought it was a really good night, like, from a communications point of view, and I'd never heard of Nocte. I'd ne never ever heard, and again, I'm not massive, like some sort of whiskey aficionado, and I, I certainly don't know it the way most people know it. I'd never heard of it, and having been told the story, and been to the night, and... Mm, appreciated the yeah, brand. Yeah, it, it gave you an appreciation for the brand that, that's more so than just buying, buying the bottle and reading up on it, you know? I think it was really, really good. Mm. I think it was that good. sounds really positive. I no, yeah. honestly, it was brilliant. I think the guys that done it done a really good job of it, and uh, they definitely got a glaring review after like giving us three nice whiskeys backed by like a seven, eight, and nine percent beer. <laughs> Funnily enough, they got a really good review after it. Weird, <laughs> that. Eh? So if that's your marketing tactic, it works. By the way. <laughs> you should do more of it. But no, they were really good, weren't they? Yeah, it was. And I think events like that and collaborations like that are quite important for. We speak to a lot of you know smaller new start businesses and stuff, and it's important for them. But it's it was really nice to see it being as important for such a well established, you know, business in eighteen eighteen ninety four. Even you guys are moving into into that world, so it was good. Mm -hmm. I and it was cool. nice to like meet other creatives that have been there because they actually recognised us from the publication, and they were like, yeah. oh yeah, we we have a weaving mill down the road, and you know it was quite nice to like it was a good. It was a good get-together. Aye, yeah. aye, it was. It was a good get-together. <coughs> Missed a good night. <laughs> aye, aye, you'll need to go to the next one. I've only been down south. <laughs> it's a long old journey for here. So what What other sort of marketing do you guys do? Or what, 
What does the customer base look like? Are you more in the, the smaller specialist shops or are you still everywhere? What You've Mark, got the five different yeah. in the brand. Where does where does Knock do sit? Well, the, the, the flagship brand is Old Pulteney. Mm. That's the one you, once, you, you see everywhere. So the, the bulk of the marketing money and might goes behind Pulteney to, mm. to get that to, what is it, top ten in the UK, something like that today. Right. So a Knock's very much the... The poor relation when it comes to marketing spend. Yeah. I, I don't think it's ever going to be a supermarket or a mainstream brand. I, no. As you say, more specialist liquid shops, yeah. uh, online sales. Uh, our biggest single market is still Sweden. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, mm. brilliant. Uh, is Sweden, Sweden quite a big whiskey buyer? Yeah. yeah. Didn't it's, know that. I think it's potentially the biggest single customer in the world for, for whiskey. Wow, because really? Because you can only buy alcohol through the state-run shops in Sweden? Yeah, so we stayed in Norway for six months when we were studying, and I think after 4%, yes. it's like you need to go to like a, an off-licence, yep. but they're all state-run. Yep. So it's obviously the same in Sweden as well yep. then. Right, so you're getting... And is that direct orders that are coming to you guys as part of your like online store, or is, have you got distributors and shops out there that are... It's notoriously difficult to get into the market. Right. Uh, with system budget is the... The, the state-run store, the monopoly. Mm. So <clears throat> they'll put tenders out to, to different suppliers, say we're, we're looking for a 10 to 12-year-old whiskey with these characteristics in this price point, this price range. Uh, oh, really? So they're just telling you that these are the, the very narrow cupboards we need to fill? This is what we want. Uh, different suppliers in, in the UK will then submit samples and it'll go through a, a nosing, tasting process as, as part of the tendering process. So it, it is difficult to get into. But if you can get in, it's a fantastic market to be in. Wow. Uh, it's a very, very knowledgeable market. It's a mature market. Uh, God bless Sweden. Sweden's paid to feed and educate my children and dogs. Thank yeah. you very much, Sweden. Yeah. So, um, well, if there are any, like, anything like the Norwegians that we met, they're great people as well. You know, and they, they, they really like quality. You know, it's one thing we noticed when we were over there is, yes, things are expensive, but, but they're always good. just that bit better. Yep. Like, even if you go out for food, it's like 30, 40 quid for a burger or whatever obscene it is, but God damn it, it's a good burger. Good. It's a <laughs> really good burger, yeah. <laughs> so, and it does make sense, actually. Like, I would never have put um, whiskey down as a, as a big thing for them, but it does make sense, something like, like your whiskey being right up their street. You know, I want if I'm going to spend the money... I want good stuff out of it. It's got so. a good story behind it as well. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <clears throat> and price-wise, uh, okay, some alcohols are expensive. Scandinavian countries, you're probably paying a similar price for a 12-year-old through the monopoly in Sweden mm. uh, as you would in the high street in the UK. So right. it, it's, it's not insanely expensive. Oh, that's good. That, that, all right, okay. So because it's going through whatever channels it's going through, it seems to be quite affordable for them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, packaging probably comes into its own there as well. I mean, the, the the current tube design, the bottle design, it's it's, it's clean, it's simple, it's stylish, it's elegant. Yeah. Uh, it, it it almost looks Scandinavian. Yeah, yeah, okay. And is that something that the the marketing team's consciously done to to make it sit well with those best customers? <laughs> that packaging is over twenty years old. Oh, wow, it really? Not. It stood the test of time really, really well. Yeah, yeah. Pack so packaging is actually an interesting one. I love packaging. Talk, we should talk like, about packaging. It does make a big difference when you buy a product. It, does. it really does. It does. You you absolutely love packaging yeah. and at the same time loathe it because you have to send stuff. Yeah. Do, what does packaging look like for you guys? You must. It, it feels like it's one of those businesses that could suffer massive home breakages if something goes wrong. Or is it just you've kind of got it refined? It works. Yeah, <coughs> that's somebody else's problem. I, I just make the stuff. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's, yeah. that's probably the best place yeah. to be. Mm. So the the podcast for anyone else listening to this one, talk a little bit about the podcast. Yeah, we've been running for oh, jinx. That's, that's almost two years now. Two years. Uh, now. Yeah. So it's it's just a wee very very informal chat every month or two months. Different folk around the world who make different things. Uh, I really enjoy meeting people who make things. Uh, so this is a kind of craft side. And it, it, it doesn't matter what, what they're making. If they're yeah. making 
that's what you say all the time. Oh man, I'd like, I'm just into people that are into stuff. Yeah, who me? Like, I don't know if I've got any interests in my own. I'm just really into people that are interested in stuff. And I come away thinking, I'm going to give that a try. Of course I never do. But, <laughs> but I, I just, I love people that are just like really into stuff. I think there's something, there's a real bravery in a lot of these people that mm. are just like, I'm just going to try it. I really enjoy it. I'm going to make it my job. I just think it's amazing. Like the people you get to speak to are fantastic, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They're really, really good. So yours is much along the same line, isn't it? You're just speaking to really interesting people that make stuff. Yep. And has it always that... been a passion of yours or? Making things. Yeah. Or speak, like... You're speaking to people. I'm, 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 I, <laughs> no, I'm a very un unsociable person. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like making things. Oh. Uh, I'm not, I think I've said before, just, as somebody who makes things, or is involved in making something, you, you, you don't get a bigger kick out, out of life than if you see somebody stand there with a glass in their hand, then you, you've helped make the liquid that's in the glass. Yeah. As long as the person's smiling, yeah, you, you get a real buzz, a real kick out of that. That's wicked. And, and even now, that's never faded for you? And oh, don't tell anybody in the head office, but it's, it's not like a job. <laughs> I, I don't tell them that or no. they'll be like oh you can do this just for free <laughs> <laughs> no that's good I, and uh, I think if you find that um, if you find that thing what was it my dad always used to say to me I'll never admit he was right but my dad always used to say like, find a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life that's so true right. yeah. you think you found that it's the story is a big that? it's a big toy box it's a play thing <laughs> that's wicked uh, that's amazing you come through the door and yeah. you're like yep I'm just enjoying every day. Every it's every day different, or is it? Ah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, our day, my main raw materials comes from a living thing, malt yeah. barley. So it changes all the time. Depends where the malt's been sourced from, what barley variety you're using, what what the sun gods are doing, the weather gods are doing. Yeah. So you, you you find yourself tweaking, just maybe making wee adjustments to the process. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all the time. So yeah. it would it would be boring if you just pour malt in one end and pour whiskey at the other end. Aye, that, that wouldn't be a, no. wouldn't be a lot of fun. <laughs> That's ace. And is it something like even when you were younger, you always wanted to get involved in? No, in whiskey? I hated whiskey. No? Yeah. Really? really? <laughs> what was the turning yeah. point? Uh, I don't know. It served my time as a plumbing and heating, heating engineer in, in oh, Wick, okay. in Wick from years and years and years ago. So the company I was working with went went belly up. So I had to find a job somewhere. So we knocked on the office door, the distillery in Wick, and two weeks later we started as a mashman. Really? On the, on the process, yeah. So you started as a mashman, actually. So you've have you gone up all the all the, the ranks, as it were, to now being the distillery manager? You've uh, actually done the hands-on yeah. stuff. So that must be invaluable. And especially oh. when the boys on the floor are speaking to you and you're speaking to them as well. That... You couldn't do this job as well as you do it without having that, surely. It's it's an old-fashioned way to do these th things these days. Uh, I know some of the, the the bigger companies, their managers, they'll they'll have the brewing distilling degree from Harriet's, yeah. uh, but without any practical experience. Yeah, it's so important to be able to do it yourself. People to do it for real. I mm. think so, anyway. Yeah. I yeah. Think so. so that's a good point you brought up. Those. I've seen more and more of these pop-up degrees and seem to be getting, whether it's more and more or whether the few that have popped up are getting more and more credit towards them. What do you think about these degrees? Oh, the one in is just fantastic. Is it? a really, really good course. Yeah. And what makes it so good about that and what makes it so worth its, worth its time? Probably the standard of tuition available from Hurley. is really good. Right. And are they all X, are they all X whiskey? Whiskey folk that have... No, they, they, they have one or two S whiskey folk or process engineering folk and to deliver some of the teaching. Um, See, it's, it's strange, I didn't it? even know there was such a thing. <laughs> yeah, I worked at um, one of my first jobs, Chris, going back now, TK Maxx. I was working in the, work, the warehouse and they had a lad who was doing it. And I just always remember thinking, you're on a jolly. <laughs> You're out tasting whiskey every day, and he, he was. He was probably two days a week. Was out at different distilleries and tasting whiskey and seeing it all. I don't know what he's doing now. A lad, Dan Lumsden, I'm sure was his name. I need to check what he's doing now. <laughs> but he loved it, like with, with all of his being, absolutely loved it. And he was just, he was convinced it was the best thing ever. And I, I struggled to argue with him <laughs> because he was, he was knocking back some good whiskeys, <laughs> like <laughs> so, so. It, it's strange, though, isn't it? Because it feels like, like with it being 
such a like heritage and crafting, certainly here, it doesn't feel conducive to something that you could teach at uni. But it seems like you're obviously saying it works. It works very, very well. And those those guys that are coming out of that, are they people that are getting them? You know, we talked earlier about three hundred applicants. Are they people that are moving into working for distilleries, or where are they? Where are yeah. they finding themselves placed? That would be the the, the goal once your your studies finish. Go and go and do get, the, some, get some experience in your right the field that you've you're you're now very well well, well qualified in. Yeah. yeah. That's that's I I would never have thought that. I almost expected you to be like, no, 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 these, these degrees, you need to do it on the floor. You know, I, I expected the, with it being such a hands-on thing, to need to, to learn it. Mm -hmm. Boots on the ground, as it were. And do you bring people in, like young people, to come in and try, or is that a thing? <coughs> we, there's a, a modern apprenticeship mm. in, mm. In, at whiskey making. It's, it's, it's just getting off the ground now, oh, so... Cool. Two of our sister distilleries both started apprentices this year, uh, Colton and Speyburn, and we're looking to get somebody on board next year. So I think That's it's a, a two-year plan, two-year programme. So it's definitely like, I mean, we hear it all the time, but it's definitely a growing industry then, isn't it? If you're looking at modern apprenticeships, degrees, all surrounding it, it's, it's yeah. obviously grown in a big way. And what does that growth look like for you guys? Are you, because it'd be very easy to be, I by no means corporate or no no corporate companies think, but you would think it'd be very easy for them to be like, well, this is a growing market. Let's just let's expand exponentially with it. Does that look like it'll have any changes for you guys, or is knock do still going to stay that? Is the charm and knock do the way that you guys do things here? That's a massive part of it. Um, it's a crazy thing to think that water is a scarce resource mm. in, in this part of the world. I, but it is. Mm. Um, oh, really? Yeah. And I'm so pleased to see snow today. I, if we don't get snow, we've got the. You, you came in from the Keith side this morning. Yes. Yeah. You would have passed the, the knock, mm -hmm. the hill up behind us. So that's where we get our, our water from. So we've got right. four very small springs that ping out this side of the hill. Water runs into collection tank, and then good old gravity takes it down to us. Mm. But to maintain supplies in the summertime, we need snow and we need a, a nice, slow, steady thaw to keep the springs topped up, keeping them replenished. <coughs> we don't get snow, we are screwed, we're going to run out of water come next summer. Oh wow. That's, That's wild, eh? Yeah. Water, of all things. Yeah. So it just goes back to the fact that you're really at Mother Nature's peril, aren't you? With, with all this we, stuff. We, we, I, we've got to work, right. with, work with nature. Yeah. Um, the water side of things is, is quite interesting because it is becoming scarcer due to climate change. Mm. Uh, we've really had to look at how we use and make best use of water here. So every drop of water we abstract from the springs now, we'll, we'll use six or seven times. Oh, wow. And the the okay. water is, is dizzy by the time we're finished with it. <laughs> um, it. It depends who you're trying to sell it to. Uh, 30 years ago, energy was so cheap, no, nobody cared about it. Uh, mm. So if you looked at a graph of distillery costs, Energy costs very, very little, and people cost a lot. And if you look at the, the chart now, it's gone completely the other way. Um, everybody's energy bills are going through the roof, and mm -hmm. hell, we, are, we are no different. So over the last 15, 16 years, we, we've really, really focused on getting the best out of raw materials and, and best out of energy. So we've, we've managed to knock our energy input to, to generate or to create one litre pure alcohol. We've managed to reduce that by 35%. Wow. So it's a great story for the, for the bean counters because, mm -hmm. look, we're, we're, we're burning less energy to make the same amount of product, but it, it's an even better story for the environment. We're yeah. using less energy, but we're releasing less carbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and how long have you guys been on that journey? How long did it take you to get to, to drop in that 35%? <sighs> Is it just a constant work? It's, it's constant, it? yeah, but... It, there's different ways to do it, but the, the, the most fun and the most satisfying bit is if you can put a bit of thought into it, maybe even change the process a wee bit, get the guys involved. I, and if, if you can do that and even save a, t a, a tenth of a kilowatt hour mm. per litre of alcohol, that's far more satisfying if you can do it that way instead of employing consultants in and throwing lots of money at something and saving a whole yeah. kilowatt hour. Which goes back to the guys being really 
involved in like, like everything you're saying here seems to go back to the guys being super invested in the company as oh, well. Yeah. Eh? yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't feel like you could do that without that. You know, without the guys being as you say, yes, you could go and employ a, a consultant to come in, but how much would he charge you to save you thirty pence a month on your do you know what I mean? Is, yep. is it is it worth it? So what what do you guys do here? Or do you just do renewables here or No <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we're, we're a bit too small for that. Uh, okay. Renewables, AD, that sort of thing, works works better than big, bigger plants. Right. Um, ten years ago, we changed the boiler. Uh, where your car's parked just now, if you've been here 11 years ago, I had 96,000 litres of heavy fuel oil stored there, which was the cheapest fuel we could get, but absolutely filthy. It's horrible stuff Aye. to work with. So I changed boiler 10 years ago, so I'll bugger it, we'll change the fuel as well. So we switched from heavy fuel oil to LPG. Okay. Um, and LPG is fantastic. It's such a, a good product to work with. It's clean. It's so clean. We've knocked two and a half thousand tons of carbon off our footprint through chimney emissions each oh. year. Just right. by changing the LPG. Yep. Wow. You must have had smoke bellowing out of you. No, we, we didn't. No, no. It, it, even when it ran on heavy oil, it, it was clean. Uh, right. But there's there's some things that uh, socks and knocks unless you're going to put your exhaust gases through a scrubber. They're, they're going to pass out into the environment. Right, okay. So water emissions, or chimney emissions today are essentially just water. That's brilliant, eh? That's yeah, good. So, and again, the, it would feel, it, was, it would feel hypocritical if you hadn't made that. You know, in, in one sentence you're talking about global warming and not getting the water. You kind of have to be a steward of the environment at the same time to make sure you're getting that water, don't you? Oh, you, you couldn't not. No. Like this this whole distillery you know, relies on Mother Nature's balance, doesn't it? It's, it's not just the distillery. Uh, well, uh, I know. Yeah. No, no, you're quite right. So, what does what does not what does it look like for going forward with not do? Is it is it constant progression? You know, is it, is yeah, it that well, innovation or is it just you just constantly try to get better and better every day? The Scotch Whiskey Association uh, is our, our kind of uh, trade body. They've set really, really ambitious targets of where we need to be in 2030, 2035 re oh. as regard to carbon reduction. Right. If we use 2006 as our baseline data, great. We, we've we hit the 2030 <laughs> targets already, but the rascals aren't using 2006. Oh. Uh, they're using 2018 as the baseline uh -huh. data, which makes things extremely difficult for us mm. because we've done all the hard work between 2006 and 2018, Aye. which now effectively doesn't count for anything. Should have hung on to that heavy oil for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we did, we did it for the right reasons. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad we did. So next year here in Ball Blair Distillery, we're going to redesign our are still houses. So capital wise it's it's a really, really big ticket project. Yeah. Uh, but if we're gonna meet these carbon targets or so carbon reduction targets it's, it's it's the only way we can, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine doing anything with I mean even you saying this is a, a small distillery, I can't imagine doing anything as like an overhaul like that's gonna be cheap. cheap. It's big numbers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's ace. Kate, you got any any questions or anything? You, you're not really a, a mad whiskey drinker, are you? I'm not. I can't say. I mean, it smells good. It yeah. smells good, but I just, I just can't drink it. I'm not a big spirit person either, really. It's no. not. No, I'm more into my beer. But like when we had the whiskey tasting, I did, I did have some, and yeah, it went to my head a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what was it that we had down there? Was it the 18, 20, and 24? Yeah, I think so. I think it was the 18, 20, and 24. That was probably man. Yeah, what, you were having a great night. time. Oh, what a night, man. What we a got the wee samples Do another back. one of them close to us. It was, <laughs> it was uh, And then the Overton guys seemed really cool as well. Yeah. I don't know if you've had any dealings with them direct, the guys oh. at Overton Brewery. We, no, we, we did a pod thing with them. Oh, uh, did you? I, uh, oh, what was the guy's name? Terrible my name's Karan. That's it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, he was a good fan, actually. He was, he was wicked and he kind of talked through it all. And I, oh, actually, we met... What was the lad's name? I don't know, but I followed him on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, he was the... You, you might be remember his name. He was the malt. It was him that said that we should get in contact with you, actually. He's the, he sells the malt. 
And I think he came here and done a bit of an internship or a bit of work with you. Or oh, David Hanna. Aye. Uh, from, he, from he, he was a lovely world. guy, yeah. Yeah. Aye. He was a wicked guy. Yeah. He, he loved it. He was, oh, he he was... couldn't he sing higher praises about this place. He could yeah. not sing higher praises about this place. He, he came really out, he spent this. a week here with us, actually. I think yeah. that's what it was he yeah. was telling Aye. us about, yeah. yeah. Really fascinating guy. Yeah. And, and as I say, like, absolutely sung praises about this place and about yourself and the way things were done, which is kind of what got us onto it. And, why we approached you about you know, our interview in edition six. So, aye, it was good. Mm-hmm. It was a good contact to make. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. It's always, like I said, these things, connections is really important for mm-hmm. everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. And what does the, what, what is it, what was the group called again that owns the, the five distilleries that this is part of? <laughs> Just now, the the production side is is Inverhouse Distillers. Inverhouse Distillers. Uh, as of next year, I think that's changed into the name of the the parent group, which is International Beverages. Right. So just now, International Beverages looks after the sales, marketing, but Inverhouse is production. But and and that still seems it's. You think about these companies or or like little independent independent quotation marks that are kind of owned by these bigger companies that don't seem to have a lot of their own freedom. They seem to have allowed a lot of freedom here to do it what, what you perceive as the, the right way. Yeah, I, I don't know if head officer so was aware of what's happening here. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they are. Aye. Uh, well, hey, if you're making products and it's selling... That's good. Yeah, don't, don't question it, you know? So. Yeah, so, so, as long as they didn't... Don't piss off too many people or spend too much money or, <laughs> right. or do a nine daft. I think it's fine. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, thanks for Aye. having a chat with us. It's always interesting because I actually don't know much about whiskey, but obviously Scotland's famous for the stuff. So Aye. it's good to know somebody who's doing, still doing it, you know, the traditional craft way, which are people who listen and love it. So I, I, uh, I, I do a lot of work down south. I've got a lot of. That all the film work we do is down south, so whenever we're out, it's like, you know, I'm the Scottish guy of the team, everyone just thinks that you're going to be this fountain of knowledge about whiskey. Like, <laughs> you just bluff it. <laughs> you just bluff it. I've been doing that for years. <laughs> 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 uh, a wee plug there. Uh, if you're going to buy one book on whiskey, buy the Malt Whiskey Yearbook. Uh, and this I'll is this buy one that year. every year. Uh, and this is a yearly thing, is yep, it? It comes it's out. Updated annually. It's got all the whiskies in it. The, the distilleries, production volumes, wow. wee bits and pieces about the brands. A really, really good book. And I'm, I'm not on commission, honestly. You're not <laughs> on <it. laughs> no. oh, interesting. It's That's got good. whiskies in Denmark and Czech Republic and stuff here as well. It's a, it's a global process these days. Yeah. Uh, Everyone seems to be doing it. Mm-hmm. I'll need to get a copy of that. That looks fantastic. Christmas is coming. That's it. Aye, Kate, there's my <laughs> Christmas present. Gosh. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll wrap it up at that. That was a great chat. Do you get, anyth- do you get anything you want to chat about? or anything? No, I'm just sitting here shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's just all this tech and it's, it's fine though. It's I know. Good. It's good because a lot of the people that we have podcast so far, it's like it's such a big thing and they get really nervous about it. But then after a while, they just realise it's just a chat. It really is a chat, and that's all we want it to be. You we're, almost wish we're you normal were invisible, people. you know? You know if, if the kit was invisible, it would be so much easier to just chat through. Drum in hand. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh, yeah. it's always easier. I know. Well, I have to... Maybe you should drive more often, because you don't technically like whiskey. So maybe you should drive. Aye, more. maybe. Ace, <laughs> yes. will we wrap it up at that? Maybe yeah. I'll look round if that's all right. Okay. That'd Aye, be amazing. Yeah. I'd love a look round. Brilliant. Let's wrap up that. Thanks again, Gordon, so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. Nice to meet you both. Thanks for your time today. Cheers.